Hello, I'm Tim McClanahan. I work for the Wildlife Conservation Society and I'll be presenting on evaluating improving fisheries management in coral reefs based on considerable amount of work on coral reefs in order to try and estimate maximum sustained yields and maintaining biodiversity. Historically, there have been a number of estimates of yields from coral reefs, but I'll argue here that many of them have overestimated yields based on equilibrium fisheries dependent models and use of CPUE, and this may in fact have incentivized overfishing of coral reefs. A reminder that there are two ways to estimate maximum sustained yields on coral reefs. One is the fisheries dependent method that I just discussed, and the other is a fisheries independent method where you need to know stocks and recovery rates. Uh, estimating yields on reefs has been difficult in many cases because the recovery rates and the op maximum uh, biomass have been poorly known. Estimates of K have been fairly patchy until recently, but there's been an effort for people studying fish biomass to share their data and um, estimate some of these important values like K. This is an example where we combined data from many reefs in the Indian and Pacific Oceans and looked at travel time and found that in many cases at certain travel times from human habitation or from markets that biomass generally converged at some numbers above a thousand kilograms per hectare. One of the problems with estimating K is the lack of wilderness and in many cases that requires us to look at marine reserves as one of the options um, to estimating K and that would be the case for most of the world's coral reefs. When you examine biomass in different types of fishery systems, you notice that uh, wilderness areas or remote areas often have very high biomass and often high variability in biomass, considerably higher or a little than, than marine reserves and fish seascapes and even in best practice seascapes, which are a mixture of uh, marine reserves and around 20% of the area in marine reserves and fished areas, you get somewhat lower biomass. This is also reflected in the body lengths of those species. Well, we also know that there are differences in habitat between remote areas and high compliance closures, but in many cases what the big difference is is the variability uh, between those two systems with uh, high compliance closures having considerably less variability than uh, remote areas. The other big problem is estimating R, or recovery rates of that biomass. And in this case, uh, it's also a very difficult problem. Um, you can estimate it from some of the known growth rates of fish or studies in other ecosystems. But in terms of coral reefs, I believe one of the better ways to estimate rates is to look at the um, space for time substitutions that um, can give you some estimate of how biomass might change over time. So this is an example for closures in the Western Indian Ocean where um, Many of the closures are up to 45 years since um, fishing has largely stopped. And by fitting lines to that data, you can estimate the recovery rate or, or, or R. And what thing to notice is that that R does change depending on whether or not it's a larger high compliance closure, what we consider usually larger than six, five or six uh, kilometers squared versus community type closures, which are often less than a few kilometers squared. And um, the differences are quite stark in terms of both the recovery rates but also the values of K and are often in inversely related. Uh, closure size does have an effect as seen in the bottom left corner. But the important thing here is that this does give us some estimate probably of, of R in fish seascapes, not necessarily in wilderness areas. That's an important thing to remember where you'd expect them to be slightly lower. But in terms of fish seascapes, which is what we need for sustainable fisheries, we get R values of around 0.23 in the Western Indian Ocean. Some values, lower values have been seen in the Pacific, but for my work, I consider 0.23 as a good estimate for any types of fisheries independent estimates. <coughs> now to uh, get good information about fisheries dependent estimates, I'll refer to this Kenyan fishery study where there's been long-term monitoring of fish catches at a number of landing sites 
over more than 20 years, and um, also ecological surveys of fish biomass. So these two bits of information can be combined to get an idea of the relationship between beef stocks and yields. This data um, includes estimates of area, and these estimates are good because the fringing reef is, restricts people to a near shore area. Uh, fishing effort in terms of numbers of fishermen. We also collect price data so we're aware of income, which can be an important de um, determinant for fishermen as to whether they stay in the fishery or not. What we can do with this data is look at how this catch changes over time and to see how it might fit to a prediction of the RK model, uh, the Schaefer model of fisheries yield, which is shown on the right. And what you can see is um, that if you look at fishing effort and uh, the change in uh, catches by the different uh, methods of CPUE um, and um, e yield per unit area, that most of these fisheries are declining. They're losing catch over time. And you can use that uh, slope of uh, the declination rate to estimate the zero intercept and to estimate, make an estimate of, um, of fish catch, uh, sustainable fish catch, not maximum sustainable fish catch, but fish catch uh, at some equilibrium fishing effort. So you can see that the fishing effort um, uh, equilibrium in this particular case is somewhere around four fishermen per square kilometer and somewhere around uh, four 3.9, I think, um, tons per kilometer squared per year, the yellow point in this um, graph. And so what this tells us is that um, the fish catch in this system behaves very similar to the model, that it, it because the stocks are about half of what maximum sustained yield stocks would be, or about 50 tons per square kilometer, your yields are, are reduced to less than four tons per square kilometer. This provides a nice uh, opportunity to compare some of the fisheries models, the equilibrium and non-equilibrium models, uh, with the fisheries uh, independent uh, predictions. And the fisheries independent predictions are the, the zero line here. And you can see how the models either over or underestimate yields um, relative to that fisheries uh, independent model for the R and K values that we select with 0.23 and K of around um, 100 tons per kilometer squared. And you can see that um, uh, e equilibrium models are less accurate um, than the non-equilibrium models where stock values are included, that when you fix R and K, you get models closer to the, our, our benchmark. Uh, also, it makes a difference as to whether you look at individual sites and the average of those sites, or you pool sites and get the average of those sites. Generally, pooling catch from many sites re results in more accurate estimates um, um, w when compared to the fisheries independent model. And it also makes a difference as to whether the catch is rising or declining. And it's generally good to have a mixture of both rising and declining catches to get uh, better estimates of, of, the, of the yields. Therefore, if you have a model uh, that you think is pretty good, you can then sort of use the model to estimate what uh, yields would be on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the long term relative to the R and K values that you might put into the model. And you can fit that to data um, uh, that you might have in different regions. And this, this is sort of an example of that using some of the empirical data and then the model data. Um, and you can see that basically there's uh, lots of possibilities, but a lot of the yield tends to fall into a smaller area of the curve, largely around um, four to six, um, maybe possibly seven uh, tons per square kilometer uh, at, uh, uh, at estimates of, of, of maximum sustained bi biomass of around 50 tons per kilometer squared. One of the things we're doing recently is looking to see whether we can develop uh, models of the stocks of fisheries in, in large scale, large areas, because that's often what's missing. So we look at a number of environmental variables. 
um, things like nation and pr primary productivity and debt um, and fisheries management and you can f develop fairly accurate models for stocks and once we know the stocks now we can estimate the yields based on the RMK values that we've discovered. This then allows us to sort of map uh, coral reef uh, stocks and therefore uh, yields and then consequently sustainable levels and here what you're seeing is estimates of sustainability at five meters depth in the Western Indian Ocean and you can see large amounts of the African coastline are, are not sustainably fished and those areas that are, are often remote from people. These are some examples of actual numbers of the high value target species, the things that you could sell in a marketplace. And in general, you can see that, for example, the East African ecoregion is probably losing 50 to $150 million per year due to the loss of around 27,000 tons per year due to overfishing. We're working for a conservation organization. We're also interested in biodiversity and what the consequences are of uh, yields and losses of stocks on biodiversity. And one of the things we've discovered is that at maximum sustained yield, you will lose about 16 to 15 percent of the total predicted species. But uh, when you go beyond that level, you can lose as much as 15 to 40 percent, which is the case in most of the African fisheries because they're yielding two to two and a half tons below the maximum sustained yield level. Therefore, if you can achieve maximum sustained, sustained yield outside of reserves, the combination of reserves, wilderness, and MSY should help to preserve a, a significant part of the biodiversity in, in these regions. My time is up, so I'll leave you with the conclusions. Um, many of them are already mentioned, but I would like to mention that in many cases where you're getting high yields, there's very high poverty levels. People are generally earning less than $2 a day. And that, in many cases, can drive people out of the fishery. And the long-term consequences are reduced stocks and the long-term maximum sustained yields. And that has consequences for biodiversity, often losing as much as 40% of the biodiversity in one of these cases. Uh, much of this fisheries work is done in collaboration with a number of fishery stakeholders. Um, much of this work uh, relies on their collaboration. And in many cases, this data is fed back to these people in the communities that depend on these fisheries. So much of the work you see here has been reviewed and commented on by a large number of stakeholders. We continue to use this process in order to develop an adaptive management policy such that this information is shared among the people that need it most. Uh, this work has been done over quite a few years and over the number of uh, grants and working with a large number of people. I list some of the more important grants, people, and institutions that have helped us over the years. It's not without these um, participation that this kind of long-term research could be done. I'm really grateful for all the people that have helped me during the many years that I've done this work. And I look forward to continuing it and uh, hopefully to get other people in other tropical regions of the world to be as interested in maximum stain yields as possible. This is some very practical approach that we can use to better manage resiliency in coral reefs.